Our guest today is Steve LaCroix. Steve LaCroix is a sports marketing expert whose career includes 10 years with the National Basketball Association's Indiana Pacers and 20 years with the NFL's Minnesota Vikings, culminating his positions as Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer. Steve LaCroix, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Hey, Chris. Great to be here. Looking forward to our, our discussion today. No, well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it, sir. So I understand that you grew up in Illinois, went to the University of Iowa, and starting out with an eye toward being an engineer, sports marketing and engineering seem like two professions that are very far apart. First off, how did you shift gears? And now the question is out there, are there any similarities between the two professions? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that one out is why, why, why I started engineering. I always I was a good student, good at math, and took an aptitude test in, in high school and said, hey, you should be an engineer. And so I, I uh, took a shot at it. And uh, you know, they, it didn't really work out that well. I did, didn't enjoy the classes as, as much as I thought I would. Uh, you know, took a few hits, you know, academically in, in a few classes. And, uh, you know, my dad is a high school, was a high school cross country and, and track coach. So I grew up around sports ever since I, I was a little kid. Always knew I wanted to get into sports, but maybe not go the teaching and coaching route. And so even with, with engineering, I was always trying to figure out, okay, how can I work at Nike or, or some sport uh, type company? Uh, and then I switched over to the business school and things really clicked in and, and uh, was kind of off to the races from there. So that said, what skills does someone need if they're thinking about a career in sports marketing? Well, it's hard work. I mean, it's a very competitive industry to, to break into. Uh, the money's not going to be great at the start. Uh, you're going to have to really just grind away. You know, how can you stand out uh, in the interview process, be super prepared? Uh, just because you're a fan of a team or a league or a sport doesn't mean that you're meant to be an employee uh, or have a career in that industry. And so it's really just being uber focused on it and uh, figuring out a way to, to break in and, and then work your, your butt off from there to, to grow uh, over the years. And what are the responsibilities of a sports marketing team for a professional team and the NBA and the NFL? Are there differences or is the job pretty much the same? Uh, it's fairly similar. I mean, the difference, you know, NBA season is 82 games. NFL is, is 17 now. And so it, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, I say all the time, it, we, we throw bigger parties in the NFL as far as game day. It's just, it's maybe a little more intense. The crowds are larger. Uh, the stakes are higher. Uh, you know, baseball at 162 games is, is even, uh, you know, more robust as far as the, the number of times that they're on the field. And, you know, every game day means so much in the NFL and, and you have to make the, the most of it and, and get those wins and, and get in the playoffs. So could you describe some of the campaigns you developed and, and which ones were fun for you or which ones were most challenging or difficult? Yeah, at the Vikings, we had a, uh, you know, the Skull brand campaign was, was something that we built a whole platform around, around Skull, uh, you know, the Nordic term for, for cheers, you know, back in the Viking days and uh, the Skull chant. Uh, we, we developed a, a several new traditions at U.S. Bank Stadium when it opened in 2016. And the Skull chant is really something that, uh, when I first got pitched on that from uh, a few employees, they did their, their homework, their research. Uh, they had the blessing of the Icelandic uh, national soccer team uh, that really started it. And uh, we took it to a, a different level in a, in a Minnesota upper Midwest way. And it, uh, it really was, was a fun to, to work on and really carrying that over uh, as far as, uh, you know, the school brand platform with our, the way that we introduced our players and the, the, the fact that we uh, convinced our fans to be in their seats you know, 10 to 15 minutes before uh, the game kickoff for what we called showtime. Uh, it's something that uh, we wanted at kick at noon central here in Minnesota for the fans to be all ready to roll and, and be an advantage for us uh, on the field as well. That's incredible. You actually were able to get, was it 60, 75,000 fans in their seats for kickoff? For the most part. I mean, it's the, the old Metrodome days when uh, we played there. I mean, fans kind of figured out to get their right when kickoff started or maybe a little bit after it. And uh, we really tried to put a lot of robust content around the pregame uh, programming and, uh, and really just to make it fun for fans to be there early and, and be set. And then when we kick off, it's, it's go time. That's impressive. I mean, hats off to you and the team for doing that. So as we know, Phil Mickelson just became the oldest golfer to ever win a major on Sunday. The scene at the 18th hole was, to put it mildly, bedlam, for lack of a better <laughs> word, by that sports standard, certainly. What does that victory do for Phil Mickelson, who had already had an estimated $40 million endorsements last year? And what is his marketing team going through today? I think they're trying to take full advantage of, of the opportunity. I mean, Phil has such a, a great, robust endorsement family. 
already obviously very well liked by the fans has been tremendously successful uh, what he pulled off over the weekend you know I watched every minute on on Sunday was was a lot of fun to watch and his his mental strength and the fact he talked about his breathing and and just really staying focused and in the moment and things that like we need to apply that to other parts of our lives as well so it was really cool that the maturity level there was 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 really neat to see how he he just really made it happen and uh I'm sure it's been a fun week for for him and his family and his whole team and really just trying to potentially there's some additional endorsement opportunities with companies that that now see him in a different light. You know, and with Tiger Woods going through his rehabilitation now, does that open, I mean, that clearly must open the door for other players to take some of those endorsements. Is this well, a chance for Phil? Yeah, potentially, yeah, potentially. I, I think the athletes are in such good shape now, both mentally and physically, that you're seeing careers extend longer and look what Tom Brady has done, you know, now in Tampa. It, it's really amazing to see uh, whereas previous decades or previous generations, you know, athletes in most sports, you know, did not stick around as long or they couldn't be as competitive at the top level uh, as long as you see, see nowadays. So I think the general impression is that sponsorships of teams, the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and other top leagues cost millions of dollars and only the biggest corporations can play. Is that true? I would say it's false for, for most, uh, for most teams. Uh, it really comes down to what's the asset mix. You know, what are you trying to accomplish in the partnership? You know, how robust do you want to be in, in your investment or uh, using the, the logos and marks and activating in the marketplace? Uh, and so it, 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 there's definitely some ways for, you know, entry level type of investments for, for smaller companies or local companies. And obviously as you go down the, the food chain of, of leagues, you know, it becomes a little bit more accessible financially, but uh, it does not mean, uh, at least at the team level, uh, that has to have a huge investment in order to get involved. You talked about investments. You know, what is the return on investment when a company partners with a team like the Pacers or Vikings? Is there a number that you strive to hit? You know, how do you keep fans and sponsors engaged when the team is not winning? Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, there's really no set standard. It comes down to you know, what, is the, what is that company trying to uh, accomplish in, in the partnership? Uh, we always tried to spend a lot of time before we put the proposal in front of them, learning about their business, what are their goals and aspirations? If it's Molson Coors, the official beer, they're trying to sell, sell cases at, at retail and obviously in the stadium as well, but really activating to the fan base. And if it's sleep number, they, they're trying to educate uh, fans on the important, importance of, of a good night's sleep and the technology around that and how that can impact your, your work performance and your physical performance. And, and at the end of the day, they, they, they want to sell beds uh, to fans. So it really kind of varies uh, based on who that partner is. And then it does come back to that investment level as far as, uh, you know, just how aggressive do they want to be in, in leveraging uh, with the team in the, in the marketplace. Uh, in most cases, uh, in, in our case, our, our rights are within the, the home marketing territory as the state of Minnesota uh, was the case for the Vikings. Is there any maximum number of sponsorships you, a team would have? Uh, again, there's no set standard on that as well. I mean, some teams have uh, in, in the hundreds, uh, others are, are more particular. And I guess the smaller that family of, of partners is, in theory, the, the more expensive it is to join that family because slots are, are, are only, you know, so, so many deep. Uh, and but now with digital content and all those social platforms, there's so many ways that you can activate a brand across the, the, the team content channels. And during your time with the Vikings, you were described as a man with a mission. And that mission was to give the best experience to the Vikings fans from all around the world. What was your biggest challenge in promoting a brand known even by people who aren't football fans? Well, which is the case for, for most teams in the NFL, I, I would say you know, over 90% of our fans you know, have never been to U.S. Bank Stadium or have been at a home game. And so I uh, really tried to build a, a really good team. And, and that was the case. Some super talented people that were creative, had a team first mentality. And really, how could we put on what we felt was the, the best fan experience on game day? But again, that doesn't uh, you know, sort of translate to the home viewer, but it does uh, come across on the, on the television screen. If there's a, a super exciting, energetic atmosphere, uh, I think we all found out through the pandemic in empty stadiums, that, that doesn't translate as well to the home viewing experience. And you, you want to have uh, such, a, such a great game day that, that it gets fans off the couch and like, hey, I want to be part of that community in person uh, on, on game day. And obviously, if you're overseas or or whatever the case may be, you're out of state, it's harder to get to home games. So we 
really try to find ways throughout the week and certainly over the game weekend to to engage. And and we had content specialists that that really uh, were super talented on, on ways to do that and and really speaking to the fan and in, in, in the right language across the right uh, social platform. It used to be that people went to the game, cheered for their teams, the players played the game, and that was it. Now the talk is about how to make baseball games shorter and faster, how to entertain every second of the time with contests and distractions. What happened that fans can no longer simply just watch a game? Yeah, that's a, that's a fine balance as far as, because you need the connectivity in your venue uh, for fans to be able to use their devices. And certainly the younger generation fans are, are not going to disconnect from, um, from the internet, from, from their you know, Twitter account, from you know, whatever that social channel may be that, that they use on, uh, regularly on, on weekends. And so you want to you, you have that connectivity, uh, which then checks that box, but you don't want to distract the fans so much with that mobile device or, or other things that they're not there you know, being an asset for the team on the field uh, with that home field advantage. And so it's definitely a, a balance. And, and uh, as the younger generation fan comes up, it, teams are going to have to figure out ways to make sure that they're willing to give up that much of their Sundays in the case of the NFL to come down to the game, arrive early, three hours and 20 minutes for the game, and then, then go home after. And so that's a commitment. And so it's something that uh, will, will be a, a challenge, certainly in, in future future years or potentially, you know, future decades. You mentioned the stadium opening, but in 2016, I remember talking to you when they were building it. I can't believe it's been five years already. Yeah. Yeah. I was reminded uh, uh, last week, last Friday was the, the seven year anniversary of when we were awarded the game. And you just look back and uh, anytime you build a new arena or stadium uh, and you're part of the, the leadership team and, and those involved, it, those years leading up to that are, are some of the best years of your career, but it's also, they just fly by sure. and, and you just want to, you know, make the most of it. Cause it's, it's not very often in a sports career that you get to experience those kind of things. So you want to, you want to do it right. The stakes are high. The budget is uh, significant. The uh, media scrutiny is, is significant. And so you really just try to uh, do the right thing. And, and when you open up, you, you want it to be a, a big hit and, and, you know, our lease, uh, you know, 30 year lease. And, and so it um, it's crazy that we're already you know, a handful of years into it. It seems like everyone is talking about content platforms right there in your backyard. A group that includes former major league baseball player, Alex Rodriguez is buying the Minnesota Timberwolves in part because teams have become content platforms. How did the pandemic change the way sports fans consume content? Well, I think it, it, it forced teams to finally uh, realize that they can do things virtually. You know, we always had a lot of discussions on, uh, do we do a virtual event or do you have a in-person, you know, draft party weekend? And so I think you, it, it forced teams to, you had no choice. So it's one of those where uh, let's embrace it. And then you start to realize like, Hey, some of this stuff is pretty cool. And so uh, it, it, obviously early on in the pandemic, you know, zoom happy hours and those kind of things, they, they kind of faded over, over time as zoom fatigue, you know, kicked in, but there's definitely, some best practices that are going to stay with, with teams across uh, the various leagues uh, it can be more cost efficient. Uh, you can engage more fans because you're not location restricted. Uh, it's easier on the players uh, potentially to, you know, hop on a, a, a zoom call uh, after the draft and meet and greet with the, the, the fans. And so uh, there's definitely some positives that, that, that came out of it. Uh, and then it also makes you appreciate the, the in-person stuff too. Now, obviously that starting to kick back in gear throughout society and you can just feel the, the energy uh, in the community that get to see people's faces again in person without a mask. <laughs> without a mask, exactly. And you know, one of the, the most interesting things I did uh, during, the, during COVID and the shutdown from a virtual experience, as my listeners know, I'm a, a diehard Yankee fan, and they did a virtual uh, 5K race. Oh, yeah. And so you would log in, the players would chime in, you'd be on Twitter, there'd be some Zoom interaction, uh, and it was very well done. And so I hope they, they keep that going. And I think to your point about Zoom fatigue, you know, people realizing that early on and then knowing that folks were cooped up, you know, sort of late winter, early spring, the mental strain we all faced this time last year, uh, I think the focus really started to shift into mental and physical well-being. Yep. And so having something like that 5K race, that was a great way to sort of break into the baseball season, see your players out there or engage with them on Twitter and, and through Zoom. And so uh, I love to hear how that's evolved and look forward to seeing what that looks like going forward. Yeah, I mean, think about the Yankees could easily keep that, do it in person and and virtual, and allows you to engage fans that can't make it to the 
to the New York market to participate in person. And, and so it's kind of a, a win across the board. Uh, and so really, I think you're going to see a combination of certain events are always going to be virtual, certain events will be in person, and then there'll be some almost like a combo platter if mm -hmm. it works to, to serve both, both audiences. So same question on a personal level. How the pandemic changed the way you consume content and do you derive any special insights from that experience? Well, I, I joke that my podcast game is, is down because I'm not in the car two hours a day anymore. So that, <laughs> that, that uh, definitely changed. Uh, but no, it, it's one of those where you know, to do a virtual wine tasting was, was you know, did multiples of those. That, that was fun. You get to know the, the winemaker. You don't have to travel to Napa or Sonoma. Uh, you get to see other people enjoying it. Uh, you know, they give a presentation. So, you know, those kind of things. Uh, uh, we started, my wife Sue and I are big uh, country music fans, you know, li live music events obviously stopped other than online. So we early on uh, watched a lot of live you know, uh, concerts from, you know, Luke Combs basement or garage or whatever. And so we are actually going to our first live music event this uh, Thursday of this week. We're super excited about it to sit outside and, and listen to, to, to live music is going to be fun. Uh, and, and so it's just one of those where certain things you, you know, really uh, learned to appreciate, you just took that for granted in the past that, Hey, let's go to a concert this weekend or not. And now it's like, we are all cooped up and, and ready to, ready to get after it on that. You know, it's funny you talk about Luke Combs and country music and I'm right there in the same boat with you, you know, the highway on Sirius XM is my favorite channel. And so for me, it was fascinating to see how these artists would do something just to, to get out there, to reach the fans, to have engagement you know, from their basement, from their driveway, from wherever, um, or doing a Zoom concert with somebody else um, on the show as well. And so uh, I think that was one of the good things that go, go through COVID is that, you know, the way that we are receiving media, receiving entertainment has changed, has expanded, um, and just anxious to see what comes next. Yeah, I think some, it was also interesting to see how some artists really were, were really aggressive, whether that was Luke Combs or Garth Brooks, uh, and so just, it was some more, you kind of disappeared on you and others were super active and somewhere in between. Uh, and then I just think that coming out of the pandemic, the, the, the concert touring business is going to be really fun just to see so much action, uh, probably more, you know, next you know, spring and summer and fall versus, versus immediately. Uh, but I think that it's going to be, a if you're a concert goer in 2022, you're going to start saving your money now because there's going to be a, a ton of <laughs> options to take advantage of. So one bit of content that I'm told that you like to listen to is leadership virtual seminars. What are some of the best practices you've picked up from them and which ones would you recommend for our audience? Yeah, the, uh, I, I engaged in, as did other Vikings executives a handful of years ago in leadership coaching uh, with a local company, uh, Good Leadership Enterprises. And it was, it was career changing, life changing, just really learned a lot about yourself, learned a lot about uh, a team that I had worked with for, for many, many years and just, you know, where the blind spots are for you personally or in, as, a, as a team, what are the strengths, what are the, uh, you know, the aligned values. Uh, and so, you know, anytime I can find a, a, a good leadership podcast, it's definitely worth throwing on the headphones if you're on a, on a bike ride or walk or whatever. Uh, and then also, uh, I think two that I really enjoy that um, or somewhat leadership related uh, is CMO moves and then uh, how I built this with Guy Raz. And so those are just fun to hear the stories of whether well, that chief marketing officer and, and how they got to where they are in their career uh, to how different products and companies were literally invented uh, from scratch and became super successful. And just to, anytime you can hear those stories, uh, you know, you know, while I'm not looking to invent a product necessarily, you can certainly take away leadership lessons and, and you know, where did they fail and stayed uh, persistent and, and where were they successful when they didn't expect it and what their plan was. And just, it's really, uh, I think, engaging and, and fun to hear those stories. So who are some of the leaders in your profession that you admire? The teams or people who really raised the bar? Yeah, it's, uh, I've been around so long, it's hard to name names. I'll, I'll probably end up offending someone, but it's not <laughs> like Todd Lewicki, the CEO of the Seattle Kraken NHL expansion team. Uh, he was here with the, he started the Minnesota Wild and we had, had time in Minnesota together uh, while he was over in St. Paul. We were, you know, on the Minneapolis side. Uh, and then uh, went to, he went to the NFL office uh, after uh, going down to, to Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, and so he's just a guy that I've always respected, someone that uh, builds great teams 
uh, very much a visionary, uh, just a down to earth, laid back guy, and certainly a, a style that uh, you know that syncs up with how I approach leadership and and just try to be uh, you know empathetic when you can be, and a resource and, a, and approachable, and all those things that as leaders we try to do on a day in day out basis. The Vikings hosted the Super Bowl in 2018. What goes into pulling off an event of that proportion? When you start working on it, and how was your experience with it? Well, as I mentioned, so that's seven years ago. So that would have been uh, like three or four years before, um, you know, or a couple of years at least that you get the, you get the green light that you're going to host. Uh, I think uh, for cities doing it for the first time, in our case, in, in the Twin Cities, the first time since 1991, uh, the event has changed so much. It's, it's become more than a game, obviously. I mean, Super Bowl week and really Super Bowl weeks, you know, leading up to the, the, the kickoff game day. Uh, it's, it's a full community effort, you know, it takes, you know, 10,000 volunteers in the community, it takes business leaders. Uh, it's a very expensive uh, event to put on for the community. So uh, local corporations, you know, really need to invest into the local host committee. Uh, and so that was uh, uh, a real honor to be part of the, the uh, Super Bowl host committee, uh, chairing the oversight committee. Uh, and that had been, uh, when we hosted then, that would have been my um, I've been to the last 19 Super Bowls, so I started in 2001. So it, it was it was fun to to host. I mean, that was the year the Minneapolis Miracle that got us into the NFC Championship game uh, to then go to Philly and, and have a rough day on the field to then you know come back the next day and you're you're two weeks out from from hosting one of the world's biggest sporting events and and uh, Super Bowl week was was super busy. We tried to take advantage of it from a Viking staff and uh, we actually rented and uh, renovated um, and Vikingized a, a, a downtown uh, restaurant. And that was our Vikings house. It was our home base for our corporate partners, a home base for our staff, and really just tried to you know, have fun and enjoy it. And, uh, you know, we embraced the cold as a community. We always said that if it's a, a warm couple of weeks, we're in trouble because we wanted it to be a, a Minnesota style uh, Super Bowl. And I think we we all pulled it off, but it, it was so many people contributed to the success of, uh, of the weekend. And, uh, and then it's, uh, you walk in on game day and it just kind of feels weird, especially when we could have been the first home team to, to play uh, a Super Bowl. And, and uh, you're still a little bitter of getting beat in the NFC championship game. And, but, uh, you know, trying to take it all in and, and realize how much of a special day uh, it is to culminate all the work that went up to uh, kick off. Vikingized. I like that word. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you talk about cold in, in Minnesota as my listeners know, you know, I'm from upstate New York. I went to school at Syracuse. So I'm used to cold. Uh, the one time I've been to Minneapolis happened to be during the Christmas holidays. I remember flying in and just seeing all these little black dots down below on the snow below me. I couldn't figure out what it was. Is everybody ice fishing? Ice fishing. Yep. And I didn't think it was a thing until I went to Minneapolis and it's a real thing. Now there's, there's, a lot of people that are passionate about it, uh, not necessarily me. It's uh, I try to find more, more warm, fun, fun things to do in the winter. Maybe try to escape to, to Mexico or something, but no, it's uh, ice fishing is certainly a, a big deal deal here. And, and some of these, these tents and trailers and ice houses are, are really tricked out and it's not just, you know, sitting on a bucket uh, in the cold. I mean, it's, it's satellite TV and all kinds of cool watching stuff. a Vikings game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 19 Super Bowls, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little jealous. I mean, I've got just to go to one on my bucket list. So at those 19 games you attended, how much of it was work, seeing what's involved in making it work, and how much time did you spend simply just being a football fan? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when you work for a, a team and your team is not in the, in the game, it's, it, you're not necessarily, um, you know, a, a fan per se, but you're, you're there representing your organization, uh, it's really become that that week has become almost like a sports industry conference. Uh, and there's so many, you know, meetings and events and, and, and social parties. And, and it's just a great way to, to connect with uh, people, especially on the national basis, maybe not necessarily your, your local uh, partners or local corporations, but more so uh, the national and then all the different, you know, agencies that are involved in sports and, and obviously the league office. And, and, and so it's just a, it's a really special week. Every city is a little different and has a different theme and style. Every game's a little different. Uh, you know, some are really good games. Some are not as, not as good. Some are really good halftime. Some are, you know, not, not, not as much. It's a made for TV uh, production on, on game day. 
And uh, to experience that for the first time this year was a little surreal to, to be on the couch and, you know, have your snacks ready and, and, uh, and watch the commercials as they, they come up live. I mean, it was, it was something that, you know, I hadn't experienced since, uh, you know, back you know, at the turn of year 2000 or whatever. Uh, and so that was um, actually kind of a fun, fun time with, uh, with family. So we know that COVID virtually shut down the sports and entertainment industries. The fans, that meant that they didn't go to, get to go to games and events last year. But what did it mean in financial terms for teams like the Vikings and Pacers and the people who work for them? Well, to the organization itself, it was, it was significant as far as the, the revenue streams. With, with no, in our case, we had no, no, no fans uh, all season, basically. And so there's no ticket sales revenue, per se. Uh, you worked very hard to, to uh, substitute benefits for the contractual elements for your corporate partners to maintain their spends uh, and try to, uh, in a win-win type of uh, you know, relationship uh, discussion. Uh, and so there was just a lot of revenue streams that were suppressed, obviously. Uh, each league was a little bit different based on the circumstances. Each team was a little different as well. I mean, so, somebody like Dallas was up to 20,000 fans pretty early in the season. Uh, and so you just had some imbalance there uh, across the, the National Football League for sure. Uh, but then uh, you, you, know, you kind of get back to, to normal here for this upcoming season uh, for the teams that are, that are going to be kicking in gear. Uh, and so and then from an employee standpoint, the – you know, the Vikings ownership is, is outstanding and the Will family didn't furlough any employees. And, and, and sure, there were discussions around, you know, what budget items are absolutely mandatory to spend now? What can we pass this year on? And so that it was really the leadership team rallying together to, to really, uh, you know, get through some very challenging, unprecedented times. And certainly, you know, financially, that was not budgeted for as far as how that at all played out. And, uh, and that was the case across really all teams and leagues and and each one treated a little bit differently based on their circumstances. Steve, are there parts of the virtual experience, such as last year's virtual NFL draft weekend, that are better an in-person event from a team's perspective? Well, I, I talked earlier that, that, again, teams were forced uh, to, to go virtual for so many things uh, during the pandemic. And, uh, and yeah, I think certain things are, 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 are better virtually uh, and then others you know, in person. Uh, are, are better. And so it really just depends on, you know, what your goals are as an organization, what are the, the right uh, fits and, and interactions with the corporate partners, with the, the, the fan base, you know, what are you trying to accomplish through your fan engagement with that respective event? And so that's really kind of the scrutiny you, you go through uh, when you would decide if it's in person or virtual or maybe uh, both. You would have started your career before the internet and social media were an integral part of our everyday lives. What was sports marketing like when you started in the early 1990s and how did the internet change sports marketing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's an understatement as far as you know, how, how it's changed. You know, I was my first opportunities with the Indiana Pacers as a, as a ticket sales intern. So there, there were six of us. We were uh, all in the media workroom in the arena with printed out uh, paper lead lists and a, and a phone to, to call people. And so you would make hundreds of calls every day and Hope like heck somebody actually called you back when you left a, a message that I'm sure was either on an answering machine or a, a paper message note uh, from from whoever answered the phone. Uh, and so it's it's allowed teams to be a lot more sophisticated. Obviously, uh, allows you to do a lot more preparation and research before you approach whether that's a, a potential corporate partner, a certain executive that you're trying to engage with the organization. And, and so you know, obviously, uh, there's a lot more competition for you know, attention and time and, and, and money and all those things. And it uh, was, was, was a lot simpler back then. I mean, ticket sales was a huge portion of every revenue stream of every franchise. It's still significant, but now there's so many other ways to, to drive the, the revenue bucket uh, beyond just ticketing. So I'm not sure if you know the number, just ballpark. What's the percentage of fans these days that you still can't reach via social media, either because they don't use it or don't want to be reached? And how do you try and connect with them? Yeah, there's, it's obviously less and less each year, but we converted to 100% uh, mobile ticketing uh, through the, the Vikings app uh, in 2016 when we opened U.S. Bank Stadium. So it allowed us to really bring the fans along and get away from, you know, sending out tickets to uh, whoever that season ticket owner is, you know, the, the paper stock, that, you know, that we would be perforated. Uh, and so it's really allowed teams to be a lot more sophisticated of knowing who's in the stadium or arena on game day, which then allows you to find ways to engage with them, find out what their 
their, their hot buttons are for, for your brand and your team. Uh, and so it, uh, you know, we had very few uh, fans that didn't have a smartphone and we try to get creative with them to make sure they're taken care of on game day. Uh, it allows you to, to forward your tickets, resell your tickets on the secondary market so much easier. Uh, and so it just took some education. Uh, and, and so, you know, fans came along with it and now you really see uh, every team doing that. And, uh, and obviously coming out of a pandemic, it's really forced, uh, you know, fans are expecting uh, cashless and touchless and those types of experiences. And so it was one of those we always debated internally pre COVID of, okay, do we really want to go there or not? Are the fans going to adjust? Are they going to, uh, you know, not, um, you know, have a credit card or a debit card and, and, and only cash and those kind of things, I think, again, have been fast forwarded uh, very quickly. I think of social media as a double-edged sword. If a fan is happy with you, a tweet can go viral and really promote your brand. But at the same time, if someone is unhappy, that, that tweet can really upset the apple cart. How do you strike a balance so that you as a professional marketer get what you want from it? I know you want to go too low, but is it ever really possible to go too high via social media? Yeah, that's an interesting dilemma just because as, as a team and your respective social platforms and, and social channels, uh, you're trying to find ways to have robust, unique content. Uh, obviously, uh, the team has access to players and coaches in the facility uh, a lot more than an outside media company would. Uh, some teams take more risk on whether that's humor, uh, whether that's criticizing the the organization or the coach's decisions. And we always had a, a bright line that we did not want to get into that, that situation. Uh, obviously humor can be taken, you know, good or bad, depending on, on the audience. And, and so, it, you know, it's at times you want to obviously have fun with, with certain things. And other times it's like the, uh, you don't want to take too much risk, but at the end of the day, you want to be authentic and, and feel like the fan is, is getting, uh, you know, talk, talk to in, a, in an authentic way, I think is, is the goal. Do players ever feel like a social media campaign goes too far in terms of intruding on their privacy? I think it depends on the player. I mean, so, some are, you know, players are now becoming brands. And when you look at, obviously, the kind of all, Michael Jordan is much more than a brand to you know, other NBA players, NFL players, they've become very savvy on, on their content, on their uh, their accounts uh, they become almost media companies. Uh, we we started the Vikings Entertainment Network, the VEN, uh, several years ago, and that really turned into a, it's a broadcast company and a multi million dollar studio at the practice facility. And it's just one of those where you really try to find which players really want to engage in in which initiatives in a social and digital way. And then once they embrace it, they they can uh, really help promote their brand as well as the team brand. Uh, and, you know, not all players are, are, are that, that into it. And so as you see this younger generation of, of athlete, you know, coming to the professional leagues, you, you're starting to see uh, a lot more different ways that they uh, are, are out there, you know, online and, and socially and digitally. You know, and, and as my viewers and listeners know, and I apologize, Steve, I'm a diehard Cowboys fan. Okay. Uh, uh, we all make mistakes in life. I've been told that before. Um, but I got a pop-up earlier today that Jalen Smith from the linebackers uh, switched his number from 54 to number nine. And then I, I guess it came with a price tag of a couple hundred thousand dollars. Do you have any insight in terms of, you know, from a branding perspective, why would a player do that? And then where does that money go? Well, the, uh, I think, I believe the league has now allowed, they, they opened up um, like what numbers can be assigned to, to what positions. And in college, you, you see, uh, there is no system, I don't think. And so that could have been his, his college number, uh, and if that's the case, you know, a lot of times players will, I don't know his case, but it could be superstitious. It could be, you know, whatever the, the, the story is behind it could have, you know, meaning to him or his family or, uh, and, and so it um, definitely uh, could increase Jersey sales at, at the retail level. Now that it, the old number is outdated and it's no different than when a player changes teams. A lot of times you see those are the players that, that go to the top of the, the, uh, the volume of sales lists uh, just because you not always want to be wearing the player's previous team uh, when he's not representing, you know, that team anymore. Uh, and so there's, there's financial implications, uh, certainly in a positive way uh, across the league uh, at the team level and, you know, potentially at the players association level as well. Marketing is obviously a very creative process. From that standpoint, did you feel that your marketing team was able to do as much with collaboration and brainstorming as they would have in person during that time? Everyone was working remotely. 
It was tough. I mean, I think it, it, anyone that works for a for a, a company that had to go remote, I, I think it, it was challenging. It, it was one of those where you had to pivot very quickly. Uh, we were all trying to figure out, making sure we had the right bandwidth at home and right equipment. And and I think it's it's pretty amazing what was accomplished. You know, you have super talented people on your respective you know teams and in, in, in your respective departments, and and everyone was was trying to be be positive and collaborative and and uh, you know pull off some really cool things during that time. But I think it's also you realize that it's it's not as good as being in person and and just you know popping in and with a quick collaboration session or or after a meeting you know brainstorming and so everything has to be you know, scheduled and. In, in, in on video at, at the time and, and you know now you're starting to see you know, people again with more energy as, as they can get in person and, and have face-to-face -face meetings and and I'm assuming a, a lot of folks their their lunch meeting schedules are going to fill up here in the coming weeks just as as restaurants are opening back up and and, uh, and folks are, are allowed to, to meet face-to-face -face and, and have a meal and in uh, in a meeting in, in person and to that point you know we know the businesses are slowly reopening um, there are different timetables depending on where you are of going back to the office. But do you have any advice for people who are still stuck on Zoom about how they can overcome those barriers to creativity? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, continue to stay positive. Uh, try to lean on your teammates uh, if you can't be there in person or, or uh, for whatever, you know, whatever the reason may be. You know, certainly try to uh, continue to, to you know, be part of, of the productive activity. Uh, and again, just stay, stay as positive as you can and, and uh, and I think things will work out. We're going to switch a little bit here away from marketing. Where do you see the relationship between legalized betting and major sports going? Well, I think it's, it's evident right now as, as states are, are proving uh, you know, sports betting, uh, you're really starting to see uh, companies in that space, you know, partner in a major way with, with franchises. Uh, so you've seen a lot of those uh, partnerships in the, in the NFL in certain states if things have opened up and been legalized in and so I think it's a it's a huge future for for the professional sports industry, uh, and then the at the college level with the name, image, and likeness uh, rights uh, being approved on a state by state basis versus federal versus NCAA. I mean those things will hopefully work out uh, here in the, the coming weeks and months, uh, and and see where that goes. And and that's not necessarily you know betting related, but I think it's uh, going to be a game changer for for college sports for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Businesses always have to be focused on the next big thing. We went from Main Street to Walmart to Amazon, with same-day delivery already available in some cities. What are the next big things in sports entertainment and sports marketing? Well, I think esports, that whole industry, is is really starting to to continue to grow. Uh, I shouldn't say starting, but it's it's just expanding, both domestically, internationally. You're starting to see uh, some of the gaming companies and gaming franchises become a lot more sophisticated. Uh, the stakes are getting higher on prize pools and, and corporate partnerships. And so I think the esports, you know, gaming industry is is definitely here to stay and will be on on a growth curve uh, in the coming years. And then you're also seeing uh, multi-use developments around stadiums, arenas, practice facilities. It's no longer about just the physical place where you play the the, the game or match. It's about how can you uh, monetize and, and drive revenue uh, in the surrounding area and have that under uh, the control, either partially or fully by that, that, that franchise or, or team owner. Uh, and so that's definitely uh, a trend you're, you're seeing uh, versus just the, the stadium and arena piece. From a business perspective, we know that the Vikings are more than a football team. The construction of the team's new headquarters a few years ago was accompanied with plans for a 200 acre development around it that included, like you just mentioned, multi-use housing, a hotel, destination entertainment and retail, a technology building, and a Vikings museum. Is that unique to the Vikings, or is that a reflection of the future in the business of sports? Now, as I mentioned, I, that, I think that's the future. I mean, not, not every situation is the same. Uh, it comes down to you know, who controls the, the venue. In our case, we were uh, the, the largest tenant of US Bank Stadium, but that, it's a state facility you know, owned by the state, even though it was a, the largest private public uh, construction project in Minnesota state history. Uh, but it's, you know, the Vikings ownership or real estate developers, they saw the vision of a great piece of property right outside the Beltline, just a few miles from MSP International Airport and Mall of America. Uh, and so it's, it's one of those where uh, you're starting to see that in, in other markets uh, as well. And 
and it's, it's kind of fun to, to see the, how, how they play out. And again, every city is a little different. Every franchise is a little different in venue. And, and uh, in other cases, you're, if it's a down, down, downtown arena uh, that the team controls some of the property around uh, in Dallas, uh, where your favorite team plays, there's a, a really, you know, between the Cowboys and the Rangers and, you know, Texas live and that whole area in Arlington is, is a really cool uh, layout as far as how um, it's not just about football or baseball, but it's about, you know, 365 days a year uh, entertainment venue. As we talk about personal empowerment and well-being, our guests often mention the importance of exercise. What do you do for exercise? And did you ever get to or want to work out with the team? Yeah, never worked out with the team. You know, back back in my, my early days, uh, we were allowed to you know, use the weight room, uh, you know, basically, you know, before the players were in there, uh, in the new facility at uh, Twin Cities Orthopedic Performance Center, there's actually a, a staff uh, workout uh, room. Uh, but no, I love, love to bike, fat, fat tire bike. We have a great uh, trail system, just a couple hundred yards to, to jump on fr from our house here in, in Minnesota. And, and that um, is always fun. And then, you know, it's the winter months that are tough. It's the, it's the, you know, stationary bike with the Peloton app or the elliptical or whatever the case may be. And, and I'm sure uh, my, my you know, fitness coach would tell me uh, too much cardio, not enough strength training. So I need to <laughs> keep that in mind, but no, just try to try to stay active every, every week. And, you know, I'm too cheap to pay someone to mow my lawn. So I, I consider that a workout <laughs> on the days that I'm out there pushing the mower. You and your wife have supported various charities. Is that simply part of the job or is there something more to civic involvement that contributes to your well-being? I think it's a little bit of both. I think anytime you're in a leadership position, you should try to give back to the community uh, through you know nonprofit uh, board positions or contributions or sharing a, a gala. You know different things that we've done uh, over the years. Uh, it's obviously fulfilling to to, to give back. Uh, my wife Sue is a, a, a former pediatric nurse, so you know the Children's Hospital uh, here locally is something that that she was especially involved with. Uh, from a charitable standpoint, um, in, in the, the large gala they do every year, uh, I serve on the Alina Health uh, Board of Directors, and just uh, it's it's a really fulfilling to to, to give back in, in that way. Uh, it's one of the largest healthcare systems in, in Minnesota, and all healthcare systems in Minnesota are, are uh, you know not for profit, uh, and, and so or nonprofit, and so it's just one of those where uh, to see the impact of the pandemic on on the healthcare system and and mental health and, and addiction and, and different things that, uh, you know, how can, you know, we provide services and, and, and potentially raise funds to, to expand those types of services to impact the broader community is, is, is really powerful stuff. Your son, Alex, and daughter, Katie, were drawn to the sports industry and sports marketing. What is it about the profession that seems to be so contagious? Did they spend a lot of time in your office as kids or did they intern for the Vikings while they were in school? Yeah, they didn't intern with the with the Vikings. I mean, they were definitely around it. They, I joke that both of them have a, a master's degree from just you know dinner table conversations. It's kind of a little family <laughs> inside joke, but uh, but no, they they both uh, wanted to you know pursue sports uh, in a different way. You know, Katie's uh, on the sports marketing agency side of things, so working with teams and brands and, and properties uh, in, in different ways. And then Alex is in the the esports. Uh, industry and and 23 year old gamer uh, working for a gaming company is is a good fit. So I think they just saw that you know I always enjoyed you know my my job and my role and and you know tried to you know the losses are tough. I mean they they were in the car many times uh, on the drive home after a just a heartbreaking you know home game loss uh, and so they they also saw what that can mean. Um, and the wins are fun. Wins are fun to to celebrate as a family. We have just a few minutes left. What's ahead for you as you continue to chart your already amazing career? Yeah, it's, it's an exciting time for me. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm real close to launching my own sports entertainment advisory and consulting firm and, and uh, it really energized around uh, leveraging my, my 30 years and how I can bring value to, to brands and properties and, and was fortunate enough to experience so many cool things, you know, over, over those, those three decades. I just think there's a, a lot of impact that, that I can make, and and I would love to to build a team, uh, and not just be just me doing it, but really build a company and see how we can we can uh, really impact the industry. What's your parting advice for audience about how they can feel more empowered, lead through good times and adversity, and achieve their goals? 
Yeah, I would say just try not to get too high or get too low, depending on the situation. We, we say that all the time in sports. It, it's when you win, you need to to you know celebrate the success, and that can be wins not just on the field, but as a, as a business. And when when you know it's not not a win, I won't say the word, but when it's not not a win. <laughs> just try not to you know get too far you know down in the dumps and and uh, and just learned a lot of lot of lessons along the way of of. Uh, you know, just really enjoy every moment. Obviously, this last year plus for everyone made you appreciate certain things that we took for granted in the past. And and uh, you know, I've always been a big about you know listening before before leading. And and, and so uh, you know, I talked about leadership coaching and and you know your personal brand is so important for for uh, you know a steady long term successful career. And and uh, you know that's something that I talk uh, to students, you know, college students that are trying to break into business and and things that, um, I think are really important. And, and, and again, just, you know, celebrate the, the, the fun, good successes and, and, uh, and, and really just try to try to always work hard and, and understand that there's always two sides to, to every situation and, and really try to put yourself in their shoes, whether that's a situation socially or, or, or from a business perspective or negotiation or relationship, whatever the example may be, but, uh, you know, definitely, um, I, I'm really excited about the the, uh, the the months ahead for all of us as as we get back to uh, more normalcy type type activities that I think we're all going to appreciate more. Uh, Green, I look forward to having a beer with you sometime in a ball game. Perfect, sounds good. Steve Lacroix, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Take care, everybody, and thank you to our audience for tuning in to Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek public figure and on Twitter at Chris Meek underscore USA. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place with another leader from the world of business, politics, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.